chatted a around a little bit. So it's a second greeting now to welcome Harini Nagentra. Um, and I'm very, very, very happy that we have you here in class today and within the IUSD lecture series. Um, yeah, I've read so much of you and Divya Gopal told me so much about the work you're doing. And yeah, so I'm, I'm really happy that now in this very special circumstances, we have the chance to meet virtually here um, within the IUSD um, lecture series of this winter term. And maybe some words on you, Harini. I hope I, I got it right. You can correct me, please. Um, you are a professor of sustainability at Azim Primji University. I hope I did that yes. well. Yes. Uh, in Bangalore, so in, in southern India. Some of you might uh, even know the university setting because some of you are from India, also from the southern part we know. Um, Harini is an urban ecologist. Uh, she received her master in biology, but then continued um, mainly in the ecology and within the urban ecology uh, topics. And now if I understand correctly and what I read from you, Harini, you are really one of the persons um, who started very early on in combining the natural sciences and the social sciences within your research, within the projects you are doing. So not to see the urban ecology mm -hmm. only as a field of ecology or within ecology, but really as an integrated field of research and action um, as well and uh, where if I understand correctly you are also amongst those uh, who always try to find the practical uh, sides of our of the research of urban ecology and bring it to practice bring it to the people and get in exchange with them and so uh, yeah to not do research but also yeah bring it to, to a lively basis with all the people you are working in. Um, you focus mainly on the global south, and I think this is also one of the aspects why we thought it would be especially interesting to have you here in the lecture series, because within the IUSD program, um, here we also try to, yeah, to combine these different um, views, these different settings of the global north and south. And surely here in Stuttgart, we do have a very northern or global northern perspective, uh, but we work in this very international setting within the programs. And so it will be very nice to now hear your perspective on, on the current state of urban ecology, urban ecology research and practice in, in India. So I don't want to talk anymore. It's, uh, yeah, I think you can do it much better and give us a, a very nice uh, lecture now within this um, uh, time frame we set up. Um, we will see how the connection will be. I think, Karini, now you are sharing your screen. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. maybe some of us will um, uh, turn off the video function so we have a stable connection. Some of the IUSDNs are not in Stuttgart. And so it's always good to try to keep bandwidth uh, yeah, free for the most important things. So word to you, uh, Harini, and thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Leody, uh, Divya, Vlad. It was such a pleasure to have you all invite me, and it's a pleasure to meet everyone else who's on this uh, 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 discussion today. Uh, so uh, just to give you a heads up about, uh, I think, the discussions we had, uh, since I know many of you are from diverse fields, I'm trying to going to try and make this not a very technical talk, but really, if anyone wants me to go into why I say certain things or what's the evidence base for certain things, I haven't really put a lot of you know, data, figures, charts, I can share papers, etc. But I, I know that this is a diverse audience, so I'm trying to keep my main points rather simple. Uh, so I'm happy to do a discussion after this. I will probably wind up in 40 minutes at most and then try and leave some you know, good amount of time for discussion. So I'd be happy to talk to all of you. So with that, thanks again for this invitation. And let me start with my presentation. Just give me a second. Ooh, sorry, just a second. 
ever. Yes. Can you see this? Does it say uh, uh, a global south perspective? Yes. yes. Yes, we see it very well. Okay, great. Uh, so yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, why we need to think ecologically about Indian cities from a global south perspective. And uh, if you look at uh, so this is UN data. I'll just begin with a with a global perspective. This is some UN data on the growth of cities, and it's from the World Organization Prospects. What you can clearly see is that the largest and the fastest growing cities in the world are in Asia. Africa, Latin America, what the, the global south broadly. And so the urbanization of the future, the urbanization that we expect of the future and the cities that are yet to be built are in places very different from what we have as an urban imagination. I mean, for instance, the, the three fastest urbanizing countries are China, India and Nigeria. And Nigeria would not otherwise be large in our imagination of an urbanizing country. But ne nevertheless, these are the fronts of urbanization and the way urban life is structured in these cities is very different from the way urban life is structured in the cities we know more about in the West. I'll give you an example. So this is nightlight satellite images, and this gives you a picture. This is uh, from Esri, and it gives you a picture of where are the lights coming on and where are the lights going off? In some sense, which are the urbanizing and which are the, the shrinking cities? And wherever you see pink, it's largely areas where de-urbanization is going on and where you have blue is where lights are coming on. Here's a snapshot again and I could show you the same for parts of Europe. It's just that this particular image is of the US and Northern America. You will see that you know, there's a huge contrast. There's parts of the Southwest United States uh, there where you really have shrinking cities. Of course, there are several parts of Europe where you have an entire research programs on the urban ecology of shrinking cities. And in Indian cities, you have quite the opposite problem, right? of growing cities, of cities that are growing so fast, in fact, that you have very, very few parts of South Asia, apart from the desert and the central Indian forests, which are protected areas of the high mountains. If you leave those sort of other marshy swamplands of Bangladesh and Sundarbans, if you leave those areas out practically everywhere that urban areas can expand, they have expanded. So, the bottom line is that urbanization in the global north is very, very different. The people are different, the cultures are different, the way in which people interact with ecology is very different. And yet, if you look at the data on urban sustainability, so we did an analysis, uh, colleagues of mine and I, and we did this analysis looking at uh, standard databases, bibliographic databases. What are the top thousand papers cited on urban sustainability between 2008 and 17, so a 10 year period? Right. And uh, when I say top, I mean the most cited papers. And then who, in number of citations versus how many, what is the, the proportion of authors? Where do the, where do the lead authors, where do the authors come from? Not surprisingly, a very, very large proportion of these come from North America, Europe, and uh, with one exception of China, which is in some sort of an, a a unique spot of its own because there's a lot of Chinese work on Chinese cities. But if you leave China out of the equation, you really have the top thousand global sustainability papers overwhelmingly dominated by the global north. And what you have from the global south, India, 10 papers out of 1,000, that's a 0.1%. Others from the global south, 27 in South Africa. So you're still less than a half percent. So what does this mean? When you look at urban planning, it's all driven by the top papers on sustainability and urban ecology, and they come from very different contexts. And those contexts simply don't apply to Indian context. And I'll give you some more research that came from this paper. You know, if you look at the urban south and versus the north, we did this analysis from 1970s to the 2014 to 30 based on projections. And what you can see is that the transition developing and least uh, developed countries, that is the green, areas, which is what we call the global south, have had a faster rate of urbanization than the global north. These are box and whisker plots, the white line, look at the white line in the center of the plots that tells you the rate of urbanization, the percentage, log of percent increase in population. And what you can see is that the white line in the green box is always higher than the white line in the blue box, which means that the rate of urbanization in the global south has always been higher than in the global north. 
because there's more population there, right? If you look at other kinds of databases, you can look at databases on various kinds of uh, sustainability indices, quality of life, environmental sustainability, infrastructure and development, city prosperity. Here we've tried to divide them across between North America, Europe, and Australia, Japan in one area, Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And I guess the, the purpose of this graph is to show you that there's also variation. You can't say the global south as we normally do and lump them into one homogeneous area. There's a lot of difference between Latin America and Africa and Asia. They also function very differently from each other. For instance, on environmental sustainability, you find that Latin America is actually really low, the bottom right. Whereas if you look at uh, uh, the quality of life index, Africa turns out to be much lower on the quality of life index. And these are indices that are UN indices based on country databases. They're not the best of indices, but they give you some idea of variation, right? So when you try and import a, a global north-based idea, for instance, of smart cities, and you're doing this in cities where you can see the top left, the city prosperity index is very high in North America, Europe, Australia, and Japan, not surprisingly. And you're taking that from rich cities and trying to import an idea of a smart city with a tele network with ideas that smart cities are for smart people. This was something that was on the Ministry of Urban Development in India's website till they took it off, which essentially means people with smartphones. And then you think of issues of affordability. Who has access to these smartphones? How do they navigate the city? Does this really make the city smarter or does it make it much more exclusive and really a city only for the wealthy? So there are questions that come up, which really should, I think, be bothering all of us about where are the theories coming from and what is this driving in terms of practice? Even more diversified indices, you can look at internet access, you can look at percentage of slum households, you can look at access to water. But the broad picture is still the same, that there's a lot of difference between North America, Asia, Africa, and Latin America, right? So to come back, there's a lot of difference between the urban north and the global south, and our theories are getting imported from the global north. Now, why is this a problem? I'll give you three examples. Because urban theory shapes the methods that I think one uses to understand cities, and the methods we use to understand cities influence our observations and therefore influence practice. And I'll give you a, couple, a few examples of inappropriate transfer of methods and theory to planning. And the first is really a question that bothers many of us. Why, why would cities improve? We know that cities are a mess in many ways. There's crime, there's uh, poor sanitation, there's inadequate green cover, there are issues uh, of um, uh, inequity, rich versus poor divides. Not everybody has the same access to green spaces. Not everybody has the same quality of life or nutrition. These actually these these get better when people actually start working in environmental movements to protect these cities. And as in Germany, as in cities across the world, when you have strong and citizen uh, movements to protect their city, then you have strong change. What drives environmentalism or city or urban-based city movements? Most of these studies have actually still been done in in the U.S., in Sweden, in in a few North um, uh, European countries. Very little outside that area. And so what we know is a theory of environmentalism of the rich, as it's often called, versus environmentalism of the poor. What this tells us is that environmentalism of the rich is a very Western, even US-centric idea of nature as being a wild place. And you have gay guns and guards, and you throw indigenous communities outside. And so this is a top-down way of conservation, which it is true is, is a colonial legacy and has led to protected areas being formed, for instance, across India, keeping people out. Environmentalism of the poor is supposed to be for indigenous communities, like tribal communities with long-standing connections to their forest, and they care about their area. What is the, between these two, there's a lot that falls. And that's where our gap in theorization is very, is very large. So what are cities? Cities are full of migrant workers, full of large inequities. And this is examples of lakes in Bangalore. You have uh, people like the man above washing his cow, He's probably from a local village and has been here for you know, centuries. His, his ancestors have been there and all grazing cows in this village. Uh, the top right is also from a Dhobi community or people who wash their clothes at the side of the lake. This is a profession. Again, it would have been passed through generations. So these are long-standing people. But you look at the women below. They're from migrant communities. They come in from across India. They wash their clothes at the lake. They pluck 
plants from the uh, bottom of the lake. And these are communities who have who are very transient migrants. They come in maybe for a month, a week, move to another place. Why would people like this or people? They don't need to be low income migrants. They could be high income migrants, people who are uh, computer science workers, or IT sector workers who come into a, to a city. They've all migrated. Why would they care about the city? If you look at environmentalism of the rich, this, this doesn't explain it because this is not wilderness. These are clearly inhabited spaces in nature. If you look at environmentalism of the poor, that says that people will not get to, together to conserve areas unless they have long standing ties. But yet, we do find that there is environmentalism in cities like Indian cities, for example, for the, of the Kaikondili Lake, a lake near my house where people across sectors of society got together to conserve this lake and have now converted it into a beautiful, protected, restored lake maintained by the local community, which has over 100 species of birds. I mean, you have large pelicans and magnificent spot build, uh, uh, you know, uh, so all kinds of uh, painted stalks, spot build ducks, so many different kinds of uh, birds that come in. And this is really a rare chance for children or even adults to experience nature in the heart of the cities. So this kind of environmentalism is neither of the two. We've been trying to understand what theories drive, what actually drives this. We've done a diverse range of interviews, more anthropological interviews with migrant workers, village residents, transgender people, special needs children, uh, parents of special needs children. And what we found is that nature stimulates a sense of place making for them. And we call this environmental place making. So for instance, somebody would come in and see a neem tree and maybe that person is from a different village in a different part of India and said, this neem tree reminds me of my house and therefore this lake reminds me of my house and I form connections to this lake and now I have come in as a volunteer. Or another elderly gentleman who came in and said he saw birds, migratory birds, cranes that came in and he's from Assam, a very different part of the country. But he's seen migratory birds at that place and so he makes a link and the lake becomes his place. Or another man who comes in and he sees women praying around a tree, a sacred tree and tying a thread. And this reminds him of something his grandmother did again. So he forges associations. So people forge associations to nature because they find specific elements of trees or birds or practices that make them think of their childhood and their places. And those elements of nature forge that connection that actually leads to environmental place making. So this is I mean, to understand this, you need to go and talk to people in these kinds of cities, which is not an understanding you can get from out, from different places. So that's an example of incomplete theory. I'd like to give you a second example of incomplete inappropriate methods. A standard protocol for studying urbanization in any city, whether you look at architecture or urban ecology, is the idea of a transect and a gradient. So there's a city center, which is very urban. There's a periphery, which is not urban, which is more rural. And one does a gradient from the city outside and along this gradient looks at urbanization. Indian cities don't work this way at all. So for instance, there are villages and as the city goes around them, the city swallows villages. And there are places just outside the city, which is a completely rural area, but you might have a very high end gated community surrounded by a very rural area. So there are villages within the city and cities within villages outside. And to give you an example, we did six different kinds of scenes in, in along this gradient of different places with different histories of urbanization. And um, here's two of them, three of them, for instance. You can see the, so Domlur is an old urban city. From 1880s, we have maps all the way to current times. And Kachakanhali is a very new part of the city, a very peripheral part of the city. But you can see that the urbanization gradients, there are still patches between within Domlur, which are very rural. Here's an example of one. This is the heart of the city. Like I said, it has been uh, inhabited for a very long time. So from at least the 12th century onwards, but it's been an urban area since at least the 1860s. And yet you have these kinds of very rural homes where you will have this. So that's a cow shed. Or you find within Avenue Road, which is the oldest part of the city, which is the market town, which is developed in uh, 1537 onwards. You have these sacred trees. In Maleshwaram, which is another old city, I mean, Divya's work, for instance, is on, on these kinds of places of uh, sacred trees and these large Ashwat Kattes or these sacred platforms of trees where you have six stones and an older way of worship, which is an animist tradition of worship, right? So you see that if you're trying to map gradients of urbanization and rurality, you will, you will not find this if you take this transect approach. 
so the methods are inappropriate and yet you still see in bangalore many many students especially from the west coming in to do masters thesis but the first thing they will do is take this gradient approach or similarly with african cities right so it's inappropriate methods and the third is i think an ill desired way of practice if you don't understand southern imaginations of nature the typical western uh, philosophy of nature is either anthropocentric either looking at nature's benefits to human beings or it's biocentric looking at nature for nature's sake but this does not help us understand spiritual traditions of nature which are very again i say very specific to africa has its own way of dealing with animist traditions india has its own way latin america again with its catholic traditions has a very different way so here are examples of people interacting with nature that elderly man you see on the top left going for a walk stops sees a secretary presses forehead for a minute prays and goes the man below washing cows at the lake they have a lake goddess who is the goddess of grazers the dhobis the people with the clothes on the bottom right they have a god they pray to and they create the god out of mud and stones so if the whole idea is if if you are uh, somebody who takes up other people's clothes for laundry you have to ask the god to help you not to mess this up and return the right clothes to the right people so when there is a problem they create this small temporary structure for the god and his seven sisters and pray to the god overnight you know so there are these traditions or the woman on the top right cleaning her hair she has aloe vera and uh, keeps it in a lovely patch of garden in a slum under great difficult very difficult conditions but uh, i asked her you know why do you have aloe vera in this place because maintaining this garden is not easy she has snakes getting water is very difficult and she said it she keeps it in uh because her daughter started putting aloe vera in the plant, uh, in that uh, area which she was using as a face pack before she got married and she gestured to me and said for people like you you go to the parlor for people like us this is our parlor you know so the, the the they also have plants that they use for worship they also have uh livelihoods they also have spirituality and they also have play as you see these children swinging from these saris uh, which uh, you know that's their play area no it's not biocentric and it's not anthropocentric it's very difficult to separate these two and again if anyone has questions i'd be glad to go in and give you more examples but some of these ways of thinking completely break down look at other you know this is this is not just bangalore of now but if you look at very old inscriptions on stone which are some of them from the 6th century onwards across bangalore these are the ways they will describe the landscape they will talk about a village and the wet and the dry lands that they irrigated in the Uh, non irrigated land near the lake but they describe the village and these are land rights titles these stones are actually land rights titles to the to the village but this land rights include the the wells underground and the trees overground which is such a beautiful three dimensional view of a landscape who does that in a land survey document today i mean would you talk about the land but you would never talk about the trees above ground and the wells and the water underground being part of that land and its value right so again these are imaginations that we have lost to the city again inscriptions of these lakes which are actually rainwater uh, irrigation tanks or rainwater irrigation ponds that people created these were done by local people for the support of cattle birds and the goddess for support of uh, uh, dharma or good luck a uh, good um, uh, karma a good um, i don't know how to translate dharma and karma but uh, let's let's see if somebody has can do that for me uh, good fortune let's say to her husband a woman has done this for her, to her husband and other relatives or um, you know for his father so these are uh, people doing this not quite charity uh, well in some sense so the woman who does this for the support of cattle birds and all beings yes that would be charity to the landscape somebody else might be doing it for uh, let's say blessings in some sense it's it's for blessings to the to the husbands and so to generations gone right for for your forefathers you pray for their blessings and you pray for their good health in the afterlife and then you do something that is good for the places and some of these you know there's a lake for instance which is called suli kunta and suli in kannada means prostitute so you can see that there's all kinds of there are rich men and wealthy people and there are prostitutes who make money in a very difficult pr- profession and put that towards social work or charity you know so there's there's a range of ways in which people interact for this with this landscape there are imaginations that you get from songs of the lake for instance and we've been doing this 
study of lake songs that are disappearing again from the landscape, which asks for the rain god to pour down. But the rain god is not a god by himself. He has relatives in the sky. He has his mother. He has his children. And you don't ask him to pour down by yourself. You go house to house, collect a little bit of rice from every house. You communally cook that rice. Seven leaders of seven villages come together. It's a communal request to a communal rain god and his family. And that sense of community is very, very important before you ask for a blessing. It's not just an individual asking for a blessing. Right? So this is the whole challenge of dealing with lake restoration. When you, if you leave all of these ideas, if you don't understand this is the how, that this is how these cities work, then you lake restoration becomes very fueled by the idea of nature-based services. So here's an example from you know, it could be slogans: "We want Bangalore to be Singapore." It could be tele, uh, newspaper accounts. This is the kind of imagination you have for restored lake. You have a fence. Cows are not allowed in, fishers are not allowed in. You have uh, plucking of flowers and leaves are prohibited. Swimming is prohibited. Any engagement with the lake apart from viewing it at a distance, nature watching, no other engagement is possible. And then what happens to people like the grazers and the uh, dhobis who, whose ancestors created these lakes and maintained these lakes? Right? So when you don't have that vision of imagination that translates to the, your methods don't account for these. Because your methods are ecological economics are methods which account for the value of nature based services in an economic valuation, but they don't tell you about emotional attachments, about imaginations, about children playing on swings from trees. All of this is prohibited. Okay. So, this is not just a story of one city alone. Across the global south, you have this complex of incomplete theories, inappropriate methods, and ill designing planning. But what's the way forward? I want to also, I don't want to end with a feeling that there is a way forward. So I thought I'd talk about three areas for in which our, at least our research has shown that there are direct possibilities for integration into planning. Okay. So first is the importance of street trees. And this is very early work. Um, Divya will remember. So the, the precursor to this work is the work that uh, we started in Bangalore. And Divya was, uh, in fact, one of the first people who joined and, and did this work in the field, where we were looking at uh, cataloging the trees on streets and the reason we did this was because there was a lot of felling of trees along roadside in Bangalore. Bangalore is a colonial city. The British came and planted a lot of roadside trees. And post-independence, India has continued this. We have majestic rain trees and all kinds of other trees that are planted on the roadside and are being felled in large numbers. So we decided to do a study on why people need trees. What are their impacts on pollution and heat? You can take an air filter and suck air through it for eight hours and you can see how it looks with trees and without trees, uh, which is really an index of suspended particulate matter and possibly our lungs. This is how our lungs would look if we spent eight hours on the streets, which many street you know, sweepers or um, manual labor or uh, people who have houses or you know slums right at, at the edge of the street. This is probably what their lungs look like. And here's a graph if you want statistical samples. If once you plant trees on the road, the suspended particulate matter drastically levels drastically reduced to within permissible limits, making it much less likely for you to have asthma and other kinds of health related disorders. The World Health Organization now says that for children growing up in some of India's most polluted cities, they may have as much as seven to 10 years reduced life expectancy. Right? So, Planting trees on the road are not going to solve all the problems, but they're certainly going to reduce the problems. And yet you still have tens of thousands of trees, even hundreds of thousands of trees being cut across Indian cities. So here's something very simple where you can actually quantify the impacts on sulfur dioxide levels, on temperature, on road asphalt temperature. So you can find you know, walking on the road in Indian summers is very difficult. And uh, if you find that you're walking uh, in the summers and if you look at IPCC projections, uh, of course, cities are going to get hotter. But if you look at cities plus urban heat island effects, Indian cities will probably get anywhere between five to seven degrees hotter than they are by the end of the century, which means you're going to get to road or asphalt melting temperatures. But if you have trees, you can reduce the surface temperature of road asphalt by 25 degrees centigrade, the road surface temperature, just by having shade. And yet, 
we don't want to have trees. This, this is probably going to impact the survivability and the usability of our roads, something as basic as can you move around in the heat during the heat. A second example is urban design. Uh, we did this review of bird traits across um, different, uh, it's, it's a global review, so we just got that back in press and uh, I mean in, in uh, review. And uh, if you look at this, so this is 200 plus studies of what kinds of bird traits influence bird survival in cities. To begin with, look at this graph. You'll see that most of the studies come from Europe and North America and, there's, and Australia. And there's really very, very little in different parts of the world outside of these places. Right. So what do we find from this? We find that there are some very simple things that so the birds that survive are largely generalist because uh, they can feed on a variety of different resources. And if you're a specialist, you only feed on insects, but most of the vegetation in cities is sprayed. Then you're not going to have insects because of the high load of pesticides. So those birds don't survive. If you're a granivorous bird, and people used to have agriculture in these cities, so you had grain to eat. You don't have grain to eat. So this is why sparrows, for instance, a big reason why sparrows are in a global decline. There's to some extent something that we can do, but maybe not a lot we can do about that. But if you look at other kinds of traits, so you might see traits like uh, uh, behavior or breeding or physiology. What you find is bird song. Bird song changes in the city. Birds tend to trill very high and very loud because they have to be heard over the noise of traffic. And on weekends and at times of vacation when noise is less in the city, their voices go back to normal. And you can see that this is a costly behavior because it's, I mean, think of us, if you had to shriek at the top of your voice constantly, not good for you, right? So birds are doing this all the time. And one thing one could do is, for instance, if, you're, if it's a lake that you want, you can design it with tall trees to screen out the, some of the sound and have the kinds of trees that with the kind of canopy and foliage that would actually scatter and reduce low frequency noises because most traffic in the city is low frequency noise and you want to get rid of that. Right? Or there are changes in physiology. You find that birds are ovulating faster and therefore they are ovulating for longer periods of time or breeding. They have larger clutches because you have uh, so many feral cats and dogs in the city that many eggs don't survive. So you just lay many more eggs at a time than you used to. And that's your trade-off. It's a risk trade-off. If I have more children, maybe some of them will survive. Can you have different kinds of nests that you create in more safe situations? All I'm saying is that I don't want to get into the specifics of this, but there's a lot that goes into this research which can directly translate into practice. And yet you find that nobody is looking at this research and really translating it into practice. First of all, there is no research that comes from the Indian context or barely any research that comes from the Indian context, which is also unfortunate. And the third is this interesting study we did recently in Bangalore, where we were looking at women who harvest greens, wild greens from wild places in the city. And we did look at uh, women in the heart of the city versus women in the peripheral areas, 200 women from low income families. And they gave us more than 80 species that they still use for cooking from different places. And this is an example of some rare produce. There are markets for edible weeds. We didn't know, I didn't know as a Bangalorean, but there is a Banashankri market. Now, Divya, you'll be interested in this and where you can go and say that because some of these weeds, are, you know, we call them weeds, but women cook them and they're supposed to be good for stomach pain. Another one, if your child is in an exam and you want to improve their brain power, someone, something else for joint pain, something to make your hair grow. So you go to a woman, you you order this, so to speak, from her. And these are areas which still have some wild patches left and the women go foraging and you can buy it from them next week. Right? So these are these flourishing markets for edible weeds. So I'll, I'll conclude because I want to leave, as I said, some time for questions. I think what we really need to do is reimagine cities with nature as part of a healthy city. And this part of a healthy city must be a very different imagination from the idea of a landscaped park or a landscaped garden with gates, fences, timings, restrictions of what you can use and what you can't use. It must be a place that has place for sacred practices. It must be a place that has place for migrant workers, but it also has to have the reality that if you leave places open in, in, in a place like India, for instance, if you allowed everybody to wash their clothes in the lake, the lake would get overwhelmed. So how do you actually deal with, I think there's a lot of place for practice, which is a, for different kind to reimagination of these cities as places of nature. 
for instance how would you you know if we had uh, widespread hunger across indian cities especially for migrant workers during the covid times during lockdown in india if you had op thrown open your parks as places for people to go in and collect wild weeds would it have been possible for them to get more nutrition into their food then so there are experiments that are being done there's a place called sarjapur curries which is a, a very interesting artist who is from a, a village peripheral village near bangalore and he goes back to his village and has been working with the women there who harvest a lot of these weeds and he's trying to come up with a business model for them because they used to work as house help in the areas around and post covid times they've lost there's been a lot of wide scale unemployment so here's the model he set up that they go and forage for these wild weeds and someone like me for instance can have a subscription model where i pay so much every week and they get me whatever weeds are around at that time along with recipes because i might not know how to cook these and along with some information that he sends out on whatsapp saying here's what this is good for right so you get a little description a little bit of the botanical background of these where are they found the women who collected them and they have a regular service and because of the service they start keeping the areas around their lakes clean and make sure sewage doesn't come so you set up this link which is a very organic link and i know you know so many of my colleagues are doing this now taking things from him because they live closer to in that area so can you think of different ways in which it's not just architects but planners or cooks or chefs or um, i mean artists anybody can reimagine the city and make make nature as part of the head so with that i'll wind up this is from a very nice booklet that uh, two people who are working on this uh, on urban foraging uh, came up with rohit rao was an undergraduate student uh, who's uh, at the university of australia um, australia australian national university right now and he came in as an intern and worked on this project so these are his lovely sketches in align with one of his sketches this is his imagination of uh, how a healthy city with nature could look and uh, let me get off this presentation Harini, thank you so so much for this very very nice lecture. I think it was yeah, giving us so many uh, thought for food. I think this is the right term in English. Like so many aspects um, you put in there, and yeah, really bringing a different perspective to all of us. I think, and I think some of you like from the Indian context might be yeah have some some. Um, uh, remembrance maybe on places where some of these things happen or do not happen and those from like South America maybe you also uh, thought of some places where these ideas would fit well or where these challenges and problems occur and so I think we could directly encourage uh, yeah questions answers uh, discussions here i would say we do not go by the hand raising option but maybe you just uh, put in the chat uh, a little note uh, just like um, yeah a dot or a point or a whatever mark and i will just um, yeah go go uh, person by person uh, with the question maybe a first question from me harini maybe on a more general level I would have a lot of questions in detail. Um, I mean, in, in, in our surroundings, we are always also discussing a lot how such practices, like the one you mentioned in, in the last uh, point with the edible weeds and uh, people making like a business model uh, nearly out of it um how this uh, yeah uh, sometimes develops because of the ideas of the people the circumstances um but also how could uh, we see a political encouragement mm -hmm. in things like that um are there any uh, yeah ideas around that also from your context you could share with us absolutely i think see you you have the crux of it there because i think there's so much only that can be done by individual efforts and what you really need is government support or um, you know widespread some something that is action so one of the things it, it's always hard in the indian con i mean i'm sure it's hard in many contexts getting governments to buy in right so one of the things that has been encouraging is druti somesh the, the woman who uh, worked on this her grandfather is a retired um, forest service person in 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 bangalore and also someone who grew up with a family where there was a lot of foraging 
mm-hmm. his family kept cows and uh, you know so, so mm-hmm. he also understands the importance of this so he spoke to the director of horticulture in lalbagh which is one of india's i mean bangalore's oldest botanical garden and um, it's very it's been very interesting because uh, druti when she went and did her field work in lalbagh uh, there are women who are the sweepers there and they are mm-hmm. there to keep the park clean but they are the ones who are the custodians of this knowledge because they also when they sweep they go to all parts of the park and they forage and they collect and they have incredible knowledge of the weeds so he is trying to find out and the the director right now is very supportive of the idea if they can run tours which i think to me is a wonderful flipping of knowledge because he, otherwise they would not be the ones leading the tour but they are the ones actually with the knowledge so if they ran a tour for people like us who could walk through the park and they could show us here are the edible weeds here's what you forage and here's how you cook them now why should it be the so in delhi you have these very nice uh, walks through lodi gardens which is another lovely park but they buy chefs from a five star restaurant and you pay a lot of money and then they take you to do this wild weed foraging in you know, a high end cooking class and you pay a lot of money and then you have a nice meal but i i think it would be just much nicer to me if if women who are cleaning the park but really know about these weeds did the same kind of thing because it's much more natural in some sense and then mm-hmm. you come back but it also gives you a sense i think very importantly of respect of their knowledge right mm-hmm. so these are the kinds of things we are hoping to do we actually so rohit you saw the sketch we have a little book that we we have a research paper that was just published but with this especially we we have got a little book that we are doing and uh, hopefully that should be out soon with sketches and recipes and things and ideally we would have like post covid time pre covid times to have gone to the houses of these women and maybe taken videos of them cooking so they could teach mm-hmm. others mm-hmm. i'm not sure if we can have, you know that we'll have to try that again next year when it's safer to do but uh, yeah the covid has really thrown us a, thrown a spin into some of these but this is the way we would like to encourage it but mm-hmm. i see a point really unless you think political buy in or governmental buy in it's it these might always stay as niche areas yeah Yeah. and it's really the government that needs to step in. Mhm mhm yeah. I think here is uh like one first question in the chat secret do you want to pose it yourself or shall I just read it aloud? You mentioned the in the beginning the inappropriate methods that urban planners are currently using to assess our ah, secret. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, firstly, thank you for this very interesting presentation. It's so inspiring to see um your view on the Indian cities and to hear about um this this the, the role that nature can play in um enhancing the human well-being and the ecological aspects uh, in the cities. And I was just wondering um at the beginning you mentioned that you are not satisfied with the methods that are um currently used by most urban planners um and they seem to be inappropriate what kind of recommendations would you have to um improve the methodology uh, the, those methods that we have at the moment um um so that they can react better to the indian context or to the global south context in general and that's that's a lovely question i think uh, the one thing that i've always been dissatisfied is gradient you know transect method so i think that to begin with i think for for us does not work but on a larger sense in terms of disciplines i think what we found is you really need so much more interdisciplinarity to be problem focused often i think we are three theory driven in a lot of our urban work and we do it to prove a theory or disprove a theory but uh, i think when you flip it from the point of view the the person living the problem so to speak then you find that they don't have these boundaries between the ecological and the social or the planning and the theory and you know all of those things so what we have found is uh, a, a number of different things let me say the to me the most valuable insights i have got about how to think about practice have come from talking to people just open long conversations with lots of different people trying to understand how do they think some will tell you some won't tell you some are more sympathetic some are less sympathetic you know um, um, a flip side of this is um, maybe insularity but we've always had local uh, you know so knowing the local language being local makes a big difference if you're the one asking the questions they want to know are you legitimate do you belong to this city right so 
So uh, speaking in a language of the city really makes a difference when we've had interns who don't speak the language, you don't get the same kind of things. Another uh, sort of a, a flip side, I think because it's more anthropological and sociological, we've really had a lot of young women. And women make, it's just so much, I think again, flipping the narrative, it, it, it's just much easier for them to do field work in urban India. I would say maybe the different, is something different for rural India, but so much easier to get young women to do the field work in uh, urban India because they can go to all sorts of people and ask all sorts of questions and nobody gets the hackers up of why are you asking me this? What is your ulterior purpose? You know, we've had, for instance, um, people doing insect research in home gardens where we would give them something that complete unknown because we are pulling out random numbers out of a hat and saying this is the house and you have a light trap that you set up in their house at the night and you ask them to leave their window open so you can plug something in so that it, it's a chargeable battery and we were doing this low cost and they opened their house to a complete stranger if a woman went in but not if a man went in because it's yeah so so anyway so that's I'm just trying to give you a sense of when you say methods it's not just methods but I think how you approach also people. So keeping people at the center has been very important for us personally. However, when we want to communicate our results to a planner, we find stories don't work because they dismiss it as saying just those stories. That's when you need the data. So that's when we do a careful design like this foraging study. We've known that there's been foraging for a long time. We've seen it. We've talked to people, but we've never got any success in discussing this with planners. So now we have a quantitative study. We have 200 women, these income, low income households, identified, stratified, approached at random. Here's our methodology. Here's the paper published. That works better for planners. Or our data on pollution, again, which is concrete data, has been very useful for the media because they like stories. So I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is methods of all kinds, depending on who's your audience, what's the, what's the, What's the message you want to have for that audience? And making sure that you tailor your methods to the evidence that they that will convince them. And so it's really, I think what I've done is thrown all my theoretical approaches out and all my sort of studies of methods from textbooks out and come back to what's the problem? What do we want to achieve? Why are we studying this? And start from there, you know, from scratch. And we've made mistakes. Sometimes we've thrown away entire data sets because they weren't well designed enough. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds like a good a good position also to to be aware that yeah, saying okay, I will get rid of that data because I now know better. <laughs> um, I see there is another. I think a secret. This is fine with you with the answer. Yes, thank you um, very much. <laughs> Ati, you want you do have another question for Harini. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Leonie and um, Harini, uh, for your like really amazing talk. Um, um, I would like to sort of continue Sigrid's question um, in relation to the methods that we use to sort of um, approach uh, ecological data and ecological knowledge. I am personally working on understanding traditional ecological knowledge in the Himalayan ecosystem. I was actually living there in a uh, in a small village in Nenital um, for three years. And I'm also part of the IUSD master. So an ecosystem design class by Professor Leone and um, uh, Professor Divya. We learned this tool called the ecosystem services. Um, which was a method to um, categorize, uh, again, like you said, that it's a quantitative way to mm -hmm. sort of, maybe not exactly quantitative, but to put it forward to like um, for economists and planners and something in a very um, um, uh, crisp way. But coming from this ecosystem, it kind of really disoriented me that how can I possibly quantify that? I am a small dot in this big nature cycle mm -hmm. and I it's wrong like it really disoriented me that I cannot quantify what I'm how it is servicing me you know um so this is something that I'm exploring um now again for my master thesis in the Himalayan ecosystem and I need to sort of find a balance like you say it's also important to um because now in India these eurocentric tools have also uh, right. got, taken root like the the forest department of india and like many departments 
use these Eurocentric tools to quantify their data as well. But like you said, um, the, the, in the, especially in rural India, the relationship with nature is way deeper than these quantifiable tools. And um, I was also associated with a, a forestry organization and we learned this, this aspect of sacred uh, groves, mm -hmm. which are not to be touched and they are, they cannot be quantified in these Eurocentric tools. And they, they I mean, um, the only way to sort of conserve them is the tribe that owns them, which has this spiritual relationship with them. They will take care of them, but um, the only way to, to to sort of have them is to not use them for your for anything, but to really make them part of nature. Um, so this is where I, I'm trying to kind of find a balance to uh, show those learnings from India to a European audience and also to a, a Indian policymakers who are very influenced by Eurocentric um, um, thought or whatever. So I would love to know your opinion on this. This is, I mean, I can see you completely see your challenge. And uh, it's ironic, no, that um, um, the, the, the forest department in India to convince them you would need to use an ecosystem services framework and an ecosystem exactly. services for nature, nature's contribution. Uh, to And it's lopsided. It's really yeah, lopsided. Yeah. Yeah. And yet you can give a talk uh, somewhere outside India or uh, there and, and people will completely get it. But so the only way we have found around it is really it's to get inside that person's head that you're talking to. So if you're talking to that Indian, uh, or see often, I'll tell you where I started from. I started with a lot of forest work before I came to city work. And I was very dissatisfied with my work because I would do what I thought was very policy relevant work. And of course, it was policy relevant work. But then when you give it to policymakers, they don't care about it. Often. Over time, now what I realized is that you must co-design some of these inquiries with the person. So, for instance, if your purpose is to influence the forest department in India, it also needs to, you need to spend that time talking to a few key people in the forest department, understanding how they view nature. Seeing if you can get that dialogue and asking them what evidence would be most important for convincing them and really code mm -hmm. the methods and the questions with them. Mm -hmm. At the same time, keep, you know, you part of you, I'm assuming, you know, for instance, if you want to go back and talk to the village in Nainital about what you found and write it in their language or have a meeting in their language, this will be probably useless for them. Yes. So you to keep that in mind, which means more work because you have to do two parallel sets of methods or two mm -hmm. parallel ways of interviewing. Mm -hmm. But it's really, I mean, I give completely different talks to this kind of audience, depending on the kind of audience. And it's very interesting when I give it to city government officials coming as a government group, it has to be all about uh, services and pollution and health and economics and all of that stuff. Yes. If it's the same people sometimes, and we do more informal things for government employees, training programs, and then they completely switch. They say, oh, yes, my grandmother used to do this, and my mother used to do this, or I grew up with this, and I completely agree. And I said, then, yeah. why are you planning this way? Oh, but from a planner's perspective, I can't think. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. Some very multiple yeah. facts, you know, and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I think we tend to think yeah. that one kind of person, one kind of approach, but yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, we, thank you. We, it's, it's like throwing pasta on a wall. We just we throw everything, what sticks, sticks, and we just go with that. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, too. I think this was, uh, yeah, very exemplary also for other situations. Um, I see here is a new question from Dashan. Do you want to um, say it yourself or shall I read it aloud? Oh, that's okay. fine. You can read it, uh, uh, Dr. Leah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. It's about, um, thank you and all of that. Um, uh, Mar Maratali, Whitefield and other newly developed areas are lacking the proper planning, like no tree cover space for environment con contributions and so on. Who is responsible for things like that? If this lack of awareness among people, government is not considering this aspect and in what way Bangalore can regain Garden City again? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Big questions. These are the all important questions. It's big. So if you look at Bangalore, and I'm sure you know this very well, but just for the others, the older parts of the city, which were um, developed 
at a time when there was more green, more space available, when land prices weren't so high, have a lot more green cover than the peripheral parts of the city. Because in the periphery, you have the high rise apartments. So it's very different from um, many other, let's say, North American cities where you would have so the, the opposite. The inner part of the city is the part which has much more green cover, large bungalows, large gardens, large colonial spaces, which are now parts of um, colleges or temples or uh, army armed forces institutions police government buildings etc with a lot of greenery very low um, low rise buildings right single floor two floors and it's the periphery that has barely any greenery and that's what i think is darshan's point so how what do you do in those places it's very difficult now to introduce greenery because these were not places that were part of the city so they were not developed with any city planning guidelines and it's just a number of private property developers buying up small plots and building as much as they could because land is so valuable so they don't want to leave any space for greenery right so those places it's very hard now to go back and add in green spaces what can you one do i think one needs to get innovative so one thing that people are pushing for instance as a heritage group in bangalore that has been pushing this recently is you have so you have the lakes that i was talking about which is the rainwater harvesting pond uh, structures along them you have these networks which were rainwater channels which fed one lake and took the water to the next lake they have essentially become now sewage drains because people let open sewage into the these peripheral areas which don't have underground sewage pipes so there's a movement to say let's revive these and build have vegetation along them create more um, uh, non-electric uh, clean up place, you know, so ways of cleaning up the sewage, and then you have bike lanes and walking lanes. So if you can't think large green spaces in these peripheral areas, can you think linear green spaces? Similarly, can you have a lot of green spaces in Chennai, for instance? The Smart City Authority in Chennai is trying to look at rooftops as a way of greening. And if parts of Chennai are simply too dense, can you have rooftop organic gardening, which does multiple things? It's going to cool down the city, so you don't have that much need for air conditioning going to be bird and butterfly biodiversity friendly It's going to if you grow organic vegetables you can also supply nutrition needs so he's trying to do this not just in high-end apart uh, areas but also in low-income slum areas so if if he actually pulls this off this is the smart city officer in Chennai that would be I think another plan I think essentially if I get I think we have to be innovative because you can't throw out these apartments and remove these buildings but what can you do with the space that you have most innovatively? And in, a, in this is where landscape ecology, for instance, to me would come into the planning. Because how do you network these green spaces? How do you find little pockets of green that you can actually do some kind of networking which satisfies ecology and societal needs? Right? So, yeah, that, that's where. It, uh, yes, I, I also thought during your talk, Haini, that it's so important to see both the formal and the informal parts of the city and also the formal and the informal uses and it all comes together somehow and when we think about approaches or strategies uh, we shall always have these informal places also in mind and on the other hand the new technologies which also might help in in greening the building or taking into account certain environments we haven't had the need before to do. yes yes exactly because cities are novel ecologies, so we have to think, yeah, we can't have only the traditional approaches to do it. Mm -hmm. Can we allow one more question from Vlad? Actually, he posted uh, yes. the next one, and then we are nearly in time. <laughs> Vlad, go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you, Leonie. Thank you, Harini. Uh, I, I just, I'm just thinking of more or less the same inquiry line, which was sort of already discussed uh, based on the questions by Sigrid and Arti a little bit. But my question is, OK, if we could adjust the methodology in order to make more proper tools to study the context we specifically focused on, how can we then work with the hybrids on the more conceptual theoretical level? Because then you have you might end up with a situation when you treat everything as a unique case. Mm -hmm. Every single not every, not even every single city, but probably every single place in the city. But then how how to find this theoretical balance between the universalist concepts and your uh, uh, empirical findings and and sort of still mm -hmm. translate it? Absolutely, I think. I mean, this is I think the crux also. I think um, so. What 
I think if you organically, so you know, the, look at, so for me, one of the core ways we organize thinking of cities is the ecology of the city, the kind of biogeographic realm it falls into, right? Is it a coastal city? Is it dry and inland city? Is it a mountain city? There's certain things about the landscape in which it's embedded, which simply, you know, so Bangalore is, if I think of the Indian context, very similar to Hyderabad for me because it's a rocky uh, central Indian landscape. It has these old rocks that are part of the Deccan Trap, which are really ancient, very different from the kind of cities that, let's say, in the Himalayas, very different from a coastal city. You know, just that's the ecology, you know, very different from Berlin or Stuttgart and all of those, you know, very different again, which would be from, from Texas. So, so the ecology. The other part, once you get into the city, I think would be the level of administrative influence. So is it a place where there's individual actors, for instance, private action or corporate action? Is it a, a place where there is a lot of commons? And there is commonality, right? So commons, whether it's a street in uh, Hyderabad or a park in Germany, commoners think in a certain way. And so there's, and again, if you think of it at the third level, the government level, then there's a certain commonality again in, in the ways in which governments tend to think about managing things. They want a blueprint typically, right? So if you think organizationally or institutionally, there's, there's certainly something that you can map. If you think ecologically, there's certainly something that you can map. If you then think beyond that and think culturally, I think there would be certain things that come in because, uh, for instance, sacred traditions. Do you have sacred traditions of relating? And it, there I would, you know, your question is important because you, you're, I'm saying global north and global south, and really those are not very useful baskets in certain places. You can go to Nate, it to the US and you can have a forest where you have a Native American community, which, and uh, so uh, what, what are we to call that? The global north, that doesn't apply. Or we can come into Bangalore and look at a gated community, which is trying to have, which has a private lake within it, which is advertising it, for, and it's it's only allowed to the people who live there. And that is a global north mentality within an Indian city. So there's there's culture in it, which is hard, the hardest I would say to categorize, but there's still ways in which one can, I think one can put them into some kinds of buckets. But if, if you did that at a systemic city level, I think you would need to do these kinds of categorizations. And in some sense, that is what we do when we start looking at global data sets, because we're trying to categorize these. Do you want to do Asia, Africa, Latin America? Do you want to do size of the city from small to large? Do you want to do pattern of the city from shrinking to growing or concentric growth to amoebic growth or linear growth? You know, it, it really depends on the focus again, I know, but uh, this is broadly what happens the main things that I would look at. Thank you. I have a tiny, very, very friendly request of one last question. Would that be okay, <laughs> Heini? <laughs> And maybe can I mention that Stuttgart actually is a very stony habitat setting as well, especially alongside the river. And there we have unique uh, rocky outcrops, actually. So it's also part of the local, um, yeah, regional context and landscape. Yeah, and do, I, I have a quick question for you then. Do people value the stone? Because what I've seen in most Indian cities is if you have a stony landscape that is considered devoid of biodiversity and just something to be got rid of. And no yes. one understands that it has its unique ecology. Yeah, they, they do recognize the value in an ecological way, for example, um, because some species are bound to that. And so there are action programs in the like, uh, yeah, a biodiversity conservation sphere that especially also the work done with those stones like uh, the walls alongside like the wind yards mm -hmm. is of um, importance of local importance okay. for example yeah 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 Shatara, do you want to ask your question <laughs> i mean only if this time um i was just very excited because i'm also from bangalore and i really just wanted to say hello and um so if there's one like pressing issue that you think that it, you know can easily be adapted right away, especially during this COVID time. As a, as an urban planner, what would you say? Like, I can think of like, for instance, Sankey Tank or some parks like this. They have like timings, like the afternoons. These parks are closed, and I find it uh, unnecessary. Like, what are the immediate things you think as planners we can do? 
I think that's definitely one thing. Open up as many parts of the city so that people can go out without being crowded in. So yeah, opening up parks in the in, in this this would be really one very good thing. Uh, hmm. What else? I think to me, since people are stuck at home so much, some kind of an initiative to help people plant something in your house. I mean, it could be just three pots in your apartment uh, balcony or something. But I think just having something or uh, I mean, we've seen really during lockdown. I go up to my roof every day in the evenings and just because there are kites that fly and it uh, doesn't make me feel so trapped in the house anymore. <laughs> so I think we need to see a bird or a butterfly to just feel good at this time. So some way of making sure everybody has access to that in however cramped a place they live, which would be the thing that I would. Maybe this is the best last word we could have, like the hope for yeah people connecting to green Although we have this severe lockdown, some places and yeah, people feel trapped in a way. But yeah, I, I, I guess we really all try to work on, on seeing some perspectives in that and also taking the pandemic as a chance to make things better and to, 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 to grab this chance, uh, also for planning principles to, yeah, to improve them for the, for the future, I guess. So we, we have so many discussions around that at the moment. And I, I really see also the potential to translate it also to, to the time after, uh, the COVID-19. Yeah. Yeah, Harini, thank you very, very much for being with us today. I think it was so fruitful yeah, for us. We, we learned so much from you and from your perspective and from the stories you told us. Uh, so from my side, a, a really warm thank you. And um, I don't know, Divya, do you want to also? Uh, yes, I wanted to, I was trying to raise my hand. Thank you, Harini, for the lovely talk and for the lovely tour through of course, my home city too, and to be reminded <laughs> of all the work we've done over the years. But to see how much has improved, especially the stories about the women who now go forage and as in one can order and the business model, it's, it shows so much potential from where we started, at least I started 10 years ago. So, and of course, for the last words of <laughs> wanting to see, I think that's the best line to summarize this time. Everyone just needs to see a butterfly or a bird to feel happy during this period. So thank you, Harini. And yeah, I hope also for the other students, it was really helpful because I've discussed your work and our work together for so long now. So I'm happy that they get to see you in person and to listen to you. So uh, thank you for the lovely talk. Well, thank you so much, all of you. I, I I really like the questions. I've got away with much food for thought. So that, that was lovely. And I really enjoyed this. That's good to hear. And I guess now you go back to holiday, the, the last part of the holiday day, maybe. <laughs> yes, I, back to my roof to see the kites. Yes. <laughs> 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 Flat, do you have an organizational issue to share with the group? I have some, I have some, but uh, rather nice. Uh, I'd like to invite all of you to the last uh, is the lecture we have this semester, which is scheduled for next week, so January 20th, 2021. It will be the talk by Rafael Tutz on the role of the United Nations in promoting urban planning for sustainable development. So please join us in a week. And um, yeah, thank you so much for being with us today to the whole audience. Thank you, Harini, for one more time and Leonie for moderating and all of you um, for joining. It was a pleasure and see you in a week. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.